primarily one long argument from the author trying to get his readers to hold firm to their faith in Yeshua. Hold firm despite the fact that many of their Jewish brothers that don't believe, especially the leadership in the temple from, you know, that would be the, the Levites, the priests, some of the Pharisees, even the high priest, that's despite the fact, hold on to their faith, despite the fact that those people are persecuting them because they believe in Yeshua the Messiah. You know, hold firm despite the fact that those same leaders are accusing them of, of breaking the Torah, of violating the temple. They are kicking them out of the temple, preventing them from participating in the events of the temple, from the, the daily offerings and prayers to the weekly Shabbat service to the feast days. Hold firm to your faith in Yeshua. Anyway, do not drift away. Do not go back to what is just a ceremonial faith without Yeshua. It's not what it needs to be. So he says in verse chapter 2, verse 1, For this reason it is necessary for us to pay especially close attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. That's a key part of understanding the book of Hebrews. And why? Why is that such a big deal? Why is this such a big, important point? Because there were people that were drifting away. It is a hard temptation. It is a hard thing to deal with, to struggle and go through that kind of persecution, to be outcast. It's hard to hold on to our faith in those moments that you're questioning, am I doing the right thing? Am I believing the right thing? Am I trusting in the right person? And so a big point in the argument that we were starting with last week revolves around even the priesthood. And even the, the, the earthly high priest, you know, who is the one that you can see, you know, how he is opposing you, how he is uh, directing people to come against you. But one of the big points in this is that there is another high priest, and he is the one that you may not be able to see right now. But he is the one who is not accusing you. He is the one who is for you. It says here, Hebrews 4, 14, Therefore, since we have a great Kohen Gadol who has passed through the heavens, Yeshua ben Elohim, let us hold firmly to our confessed allegiance. And so one of the points that's coming up here in these next verses, this next chapter, is that the earthly high priest has limitations that the great high priest does not. And so one major point, you know, even though the earthly high priest, that he has the authority in the moment to keep you out of the temple, he is not able. He is unable to escort you into the Holy of Holies before the throne of grace with any kind of confidence because in, in the uh, conducting of his own duties, he is reminded of his own sin that must be dealt with. But in contrast, Yeshua, our great high priest, gives us the, the, that ability to go into his presence with confidence and with boldness in, before the throne of grace. He says, therefore, closing out first, uh, chapter 4, let us draw near to the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace for help in time of need. And it truly is a great, great reversal of the current earthly situation, of the current order and authority. You know, who can approach the throne of grace? Who can go to the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat, with any kind of confidence? And that's actually a question that the Jewish people have been asking for a long time. You see it back in Psalm 24. Who may go up on the mountain of Adonai? Who may stand in his holy place? It's one with clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted his soul in vain, nor swore deceitfully. He says, he goes on and he says, um, so who can ascend, essentially? Who is the one with clean hands? It's the king of glory. <coughs> he says, lift up your hands, o gate, heads, O gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors, that the king of glory may come in. 
Who is this King of glory? Adonai, strong and mighty. Adonai, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, you everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Adonai Tzavot. He is the King of glory. And we know who that King of glory is, don't we? We know that that King of glory is the Messiah, the Son of David. He is the King of glory. He is the one who can ascend and enter into that throne room. And any, he is also who can ascend, who can go. It's anyone that he allows or anyone that he brings with him to the throne of grace. And who is that? Isn't that his people? Isn't that those who put their faith and their trust in the King of glory? in Yeshua, the Messiah, because He escorts us in. He is our advocate. He is the one who speaks for us. He is our Redeemer. And so it begins what is this contrast between what the great high priest can do versus the earthly high priest can do. The one who claims to have authority to kick them out of the temple doesn't have as much authority and power as he may think. And, but it's the one that they can see. It's the high priest of the, uh, that they can see there on earth. They're concerned more about that opinion. Who is the one who is ruling that the readers are so concerned about. But the earthly Levitical priesthood has limitations <coughs> where the priesthood of the Messiah does not. And we may, we're really only going to get through the limits of the priesthood. Levitical priesthood today. So we'll continue on with this next week in terms of what about Messiah and Yeshua and his priesthood. But you know, in discussing the earthly priesthood limits, I want you to notice something of it that's important. And, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago in looking at Moses. But the, the author does the same thing with the priesthood that he did with Moses back in chapter 3. Y'all might remember this. He says, therefore, holy brothers and sisters, partners in a heavenly calling, take notice of Yeshua, the emissary and Kohen Gadol that we affirm. He was faithful to the one who appointed him in his house, as was Moses also, for he has been considered worthy of more glory than Moses, even as the builder of the house has more glory than the house. He says, for every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses surely was faithful in all God's house as a servant for a witness of things to be spoken later. But Messiah as son is over God's house, and we are his house, if we hold firm to our boldness and what we are proud to hope. Remember, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. But I want you to imagine this situation. He's trying to show how Yeshua is better and greater and, and more important for our lives than is Moses. But imagine for a second that, they, that Yeshua and Moses were two political candidates running for office. Can you imagine a, a campaign ad for Yeshua over Moses like this in today's world. What do our, most of our political ads look like? You would never expect a political ad to be this nice, right? They're not this nice to each other. You know, there are some people, campaigns and candidates out there that they can't really say a whole lot of good about themselves and their record and what they stand for. And so instead, they try to say a lot of bad things about their opponent. And they call those what? They call those the negative ads, right? Does this sound like a negative ad? Not at all. See, the author is saying that Messiah Yeshua is, is greater than Moses, but the key is that the author does so without denigrating or tearing down Moses. And that is such a contrast to most of 
what we see in the political world today, but it's also a contrast to much of what we see in Christian history, which has taken the negative ad approach to regarding Moses, regarding the law of Moses, and anything that reminds them of the Jewish stuff. And y'all have read a lot of their quotations and seen a lot of the things that they say about Moses, about the, the Torah, about um, the Jewish foundation of faith. And so much of Christian history has done a negative ad in tearing down and denigrating Moses in order to make Jesus, in order to make Yeshua look better. But that tactic, if you're trying to reach Jewish people with Messiah, that actually closes the door when you're sharing Messiah with them. That's like some people say those negative ads really work, right? But how, how often do you watch one of those negative political ads and you say, well, I know I'm not going to vote for that guy because of the way that they're speaking about the other person. So the author is saying that Messiah Yeshua is greater, but he does so without denigrating or tearing down Moses. And we looked at this. That some of the things that Moses, that Hebrews 3 says was that Moses was faithful to God who appointed him. So Moses was faithful, and it was God who put him in that position. He also says that Moses was faithful in all of God's house, in all that he had been called and appointed to do. <coughs> Moses was doing it correctly, and he was a witness to things spoken later. Moses was doing all of those things, and he was doing them well. He was doing them faithfully to the point where even Yeshua said in John chapter 5, if you believe Moses, then you would believe me. Because Moses, you know, Moses wrote about Messiah. So he is speaking about Moses in good terms. Yeshua is built up without tearing down Moses. And so the author does the same thing with the priesthood. He does show their limitations, but he does so without dismissing their importance or significance. Look in chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 5. He had just gotten finished saying, we can draw near to the throne of grace with boldness because we have this great high priest so that we may receive mercy and find grace for help in time of need. But he says, for every Kohen Gadol, every high priest taken from among, from among men is appointed to act on behalf of people in matters relating to God so that he may offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to empathize with, those, with the ignorant and deluded since he himself also is subject to weakness. Okay? Look at some of the things that he's saying about the high priest and about the priesthood. Again, these are the ones that are kicking these believers in Yeshua out of the temple. He says they are human beings. They're just like any one of you. And they've been also been, uh, they're appointed to this role. That's supposed to be number two. Appointed is supposed to be number two. But he's appointed by God. To fill a certain role to the, to the position that he is in. God has opened and made and created this position for a person to fill. And it's with matters relating to God. Again, does this sound like a negative ad so far? The high priest is a legitimate person, a legitimate position, a legitimate <coughs> office doing legitimate things. He is, is working on behalf of the people. That's what the high priest is supposed to be doing. He is supposed to be serving Israel. He is working on their behalf. And what he is doing is he is maintaining their relationship with God. He is making sure the high priest is supposed to be the one who is helping them maintain and restore and keep their relationship with God in the right place, in the doing the right things, and he's you know, assisting and aiding in them and leading them in worship. That's what the high priest is supposed to do. 
goes on that he says in these verses, he says that he offers gifts and sacrifices and offerings. So these are sin, uh, gifts and sacrifices for sins, it says specifically, but those are also talking about purification. Those are talking about uh, offerings for fellowship with God. And these are all things that are required or prescribed by the Torah. The Leviticus and all these things lays it out exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And so the priest, the high priest and the priesthood are doing what God had told them to do in leading, <coughs> directing, and guiding the people correctly. And he says the high priest also is able to empathize or he is able to deal gently with the people, even the ones who are ignorant, who don't even know the Torah, or who are committing unintentional sins. And he is supposed to be able to empathize or deal gently with the deluded or the misguided or those who are going astray, who think, and maybe even the ones who think they are perfect or who are right with God, so they're not supposed to be harsh with those that may be going astray. And of course, the high priest, the priesthood, what do they think about these believers in Yeshua? They think, they're, they're, they think that the believers in Yeshua are going in the wrong direction. And so how are they supposed to deal with them? They're supposed to deal gently. They're supposed to empathize. And they are able to do that. They are able to empathize. They are able to deal gently with the people who may be ignorant, who may be deluded, because the high priest shares the same weakness of sin that they do. Because the high priest, even in his important position, is not perfect. Verse 3 says, For this reason he has to make offerings. The high priest has to make offerings for sins. Just as for the people, so also for himself. And no one takes his honor for himself, but only when he is called by God as Aaron was. All right, so he is reminded of these things. He has to make offering for sin first for himself. Before he can make an offering for the, the people, he has to make an offering for for his own sins. And that's a rule that's prescribed within the Torah. And every time he does it, he's reminded of the fact that, yes, I have sinned before God. I am not perfect before God. I am in need of God's mercy, just like I'm going to be asking on behalf of everybody else. The high priest has to make offerings for his own sins. And then he can come and make offerings for the rest of the people's sins because they have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And those are also rules and those are also instructions that come at prescribed in the Torah. So the high priest in doing that function and the priests and the Levites in doing their function are doing things prescribed by the Torah for the benefit of the people. And he says that so this, such a person does not or, or should not just claim or take hold of this honor. You see how it says that there? No one takes this honor for himself. That's verse 4. Which is interesting, which means that the priesthood and serving in that role is an honor. He's not denigrating or ridiculing or criticizing the role and the position. It is, in fact, an honor. And they're not supposed to, to take this role, they're not supposed to uh, do all of this as a means for personal gain or promotion. Because those who did, you know, it delegitimizes and corrupts. That's how the priesthood 
gets corrupted. That's how it starts doing those things that it's not supposed to do, is when they are taking hold of it for other reasons other than serving and honoring God and serving and honoring the people. It delegitimizes and corrupts those positions. You know, we may or may not like a particular president that holds the office. We may not like a particular president that holds the office. And we talk about it in the terms of how they are bringing down and tearing down the office. But you still respect the office. You're supposed to, anyway. And then he talks about the priest, the high priest and the priesthood as these are supposed to be only those who are called of God. Those who have the right heart and the attitude are the ones that are supposed to fulfill these positions. And he mentions, like Aaron, who was the first called to the position. But the interesting thing about this is that just as Aaron was the first, number two and number three were examples of people who didn't do it the right way. Y'all remember Nadab and Abihu? Y'all remember them? They came about in Leviticus 10 and offered the unauthorized fire. Y'all remember that incident and how that went down? But at the end of that, it says, as they were giving the unauthorized fire, it says, so fire came out from the presence of Adonai and consumed them. And so they died before Adonai. And then Moses said to Aaron, this is what Adonai spoke of, saying, to those who are near me, I will show myself holy upon their faces, upon the faces of all the people. I will be glorified. So God will show himself holy. This is what he's saying he's supposed to do. He's supposed to show himself holy through the ministry of the priesthood. That's what he's attempting to do. Through the high priest, through the Levitical priesthood, through the Aaronic priesthood, he is trying to show himself holy in the eyes and the faces of all the people. But it's also important to note that God also will hold the priesthood accountable when they do wrong. Is that important for the readers of, of Hebrews to know and understand? Yeah. Because as these guys may be doing wrong today, or in their day, and how they are treating the believers in Yeshua, they need to understand that God is going to hold them accountable. But this, we need to understand, this is not a statement that denigrates or delegitimizes uh, the, the high priest, the Aaronic priesthood, the Levitical uh, service. So even though they may be people filling the role in the moment, doing wrong, the office or the role or the title is still valid and good and necessary. But it does have limitations. Because perfection or completion cannot be attained through these roles. He says that in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. It says, Now if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for based on it the people had been given the Torah, what further need was there a different Kohen, a different priest, to arise, designated according to the order of Melchizedek, and not according to the order of Aaron? So keep, remember, keep in mind, Levitical priesthood is not bad, it is not obsolete, it is not worthless. It has a place in the life of the believing community, and they want to be a part of it. And then we also have to make note and point, and many of y'all know this, that the, the priesthood in some form is coming back during the millennial, millennial kingdom. Y'all try to say that three times fast. But... The priesthood is coming back in the Millennial Kingdom. It will have a function, it will have a role, and something that will be going on in it. But, by itself, the Levitical priesthood cannot make it perfect. It cannot complete. But it can maintain that relationship with God, but it does not and cannot establish the relationship with God. 
The ministry of the priesthood does not establish the relationship with God. The Levitical priesthood was never about salvation. It's about that maintenance of relationship. It's the means of restoration when we fall short of His glory. The Levitical priesthood in all of their duties and their function was given in the terms of the covenant at Sinai, the Mosaic covenant, to a people who had already been redeemed. We've made that point before. The Exodus was actually their redemption. Their moment of justification. That moment that pictures and symbolizes the time of when they are made into right relationship with God. The Exodus is their redemption. So the Israelites were actually redeemed. We would use the term saved. Before the Mosaic Covenant was given. Meaning that redemption takes place not under the Mosaic Covenant, but redemption takes place under which covenant? The Abrahamic Covenant. That's where and where they were redeemed. Based on the promise of God, crediting it to those who believe and obey. Abraham believed God that he would have descendants and it was credited to him as righteousness the Israelites were believing God and so they did what before the last plague came they believed God to do something that didn't make sense which was put the blood over the doorposts and we'll get again to the, we'll get to this a bit later maybe next week or so but we need a priest that's actually appointed not under the Mosaic Covenant. We need a priest who is appointed under the Abrahamic Covenant who will be able to address the terms and the situation under the Abrahamic. We'll get into that again later. But the Sinai Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, which gives us the Levites and the Aaronic priesthood, that's when God shows His redeemed people how He wants them to live how he wants them to live in the kingdom of God. Sinai is about the way of life in his kingdom. It's about discipleship, is what we would call it. So keeping the Torah does not save, and it never did. We are saved, and then we are called to live by the Torah. The inability to perfect the worshiper, to justify the worshiper before God, that inability to do that, that limitation by that priesthood to do that is confirmed again in chapters 9 and chapter 10. Hebrews 9, 8 says, By this, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, makes clear that the way into the Holy of Holies had not yet been revealed while the first tent is still standing. It is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, gifts and sacrifices are being offered that cannot make the worshiper perfect with respect to conscience. They still know that their sin is a part of their lives. Hebrews 10, 1 says it like this. The Torah has a shadow of the good things to come, not the form itself of the realities. For this reason, it can never, by means of the same sacrifices that they continually, they offer constantly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near. Y'all see that? Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshippers, cleansed once and for all, would no longer have consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices is a reminder of sins year after year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away the sins. So the ceremonies that the readers were cut off from, all of those daily prayers, all of those sacrifices, the weekly Shabbat services, the pilgrimage feasts, those very things that they were considering, you know, renouncing faith in Yeshua, renouncing Messiah, they were considering going back to those things are really, at best, reminders that their relationship with God needs something more than they can offer. 
that their relationship with God needs establishment. All those sacrifices and our offerings remind them, they remind, should remind us of our need to be born again. Right? That's the language that Yeshua used. You must be born again. You can't just go with what you've been doing or who you are or what, you, what has been happening all the time. You need to be born again, made spiritually alive. And so these sacrifices, these offerings, they only take on a greater meaning. They only take on a greater significance when that relationship with God is grounded and assured in the Messiah. So the priests, they have to repeat those sacrifices over and over again. And those repetitions should remind them of their need for God to provide the sacrifice for them. That's what they need. And so even those Levitical priests who are going through the, the offerings and all of the ritual, they are reminded of their own sin because they have to offer for their, their own sin first before they can minister to the people. And they can only go into the outer areas of the tabernacle and the temple. They don't have access with boldness to the throne of grace. Hebrews 9, 6 says, Now with these things prepared this way, the, the Kohanim, the priests, do continually enter into the outer tent while completing the services. So every day, multiple times a day, the priests are going in to go through the service, the prayers and the morning, evening offerings, and they are doing things prescribed by the Torah. And the temple service, you know, which was given to David by the Spirit of God, you know, that's 1 Chronicles 28. It says, David gave Solomon his son the pattern of the porch, the houses, storerooms, upper rooms, inner rooms, the place of atonement, and the plan of all that he had by the Ruach, by the Spirit, for the courts of the house of Adonai, and all the surrounding rooms, for the storehouses of the house of God, for the treasuries of the dedicated things, also for the divisions of the Kohanim and the Levites, for all the tasks of the Abadah, which is the work or service, which is also a word used for prayer, of the house of Adonai, and for all of the vessels of the Abadah in the house of Adonai. So these things are things that come from God. They're not unimportant, but they are also reminders of their limitations because even though they are going on in, in a daily basis, and they're going in to these outer courts of the temples, the priests are limited. Even the high priest is limited to where he can go and how often. In Hebrews 9, 7, but into the inner the inner court, he can only go how many times? Once. Once a year. The Kohen Gadol, Kohen Gadol alone. And not without blood, which he offers, again, first for himself. And then for the unintentional sins of the people. He's limited. He's not allowed to just walk in whenever he feels like it. Can you all imagine having a room in your house that you're only allowed to go in one time a year? And in fact, if you did go in on a, on a time that was not prescribed or allowed, you would die. How many of you would like to have that room in your house? I wouldn't. You'd just be paying for air conditioning or heating in a room you didn't, you didn't use. But he is limited. The high priest only has access to the throne of grace, which is that, that picture of the, the Ark of the Covenant, the atonement seat, the throne of God. Once a year on Yom Kippurim, the day of atonement. And he cannot go in boldly. He cannot go in there confidently. Because he is reminded of his own sins, his own limitations, 
and he is primarily addressing the unintentional sins of the people, not the things done on purpose. And he can only go in this, it, and it only lasts, is only good for one year. Because the priest, the high priest, their work has to be done the next day, the next year. It just keeps going and going and going. And it's described and pointed out or symbolized by the fact that they don't get to sit down. But they always have to remain standing because their work is not finished. He says, indeed, every Cohen stands day by day serving and offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away, can never remove these sins. That's the limitation. He's not saying what the priesthood is doing. He's not saying that the high priest is worthless or unnecessary. He's saying they have limits. But notice this, every high priest stands in that work. Remember what it said, the opening statement from the book about Yeshua, in contrast. Verse, chapter 1, verse 3. It says, when he had made purification for our sins, that's the, the taking away part, the removal of sins. What did he do? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So when he does it, sins are taken away. When he does it, the work is completed. When he does it, he sits down at the right hand of God. But the priests, even the high priest, they can't do that. They can't make this claim. And part of the reason why is that they have to be replaced themselves from time to time. Because while their work never ends, their lives do. Hebrews 7, 23, you know, says, Now on the one hand, many have become kohanim, many have become priests, who through death are prevented from continuing in their office. They are limited by their lifespan. They don't live forever. Death still has power over them. Aaron died, his sons died, and Israel had to appoint others to take their place and it all goes back to that weakness that they have. For the Torah appoints as Kohanim, Godolim, men who have this weakness. It's this weakness and sin that he talked about before helps them, uh, the priests, even the high priest, to deal gently, to empathize with those who are still struggling, who are in their walk of faith. But contrast that to Yeshua. Yeshua is said, we talked about this last week, Yeshua shares or, or is able to uh, empathize and deal gently with us by sharing in our humanity. But he does so by sharing in our temptation, but without the weakness that the priest has. He says, for we do not have a Kohen Gadol who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all the same ways, yet without sin. He understands the weak, he understands the temptations, he understands the difficulties. He's able to sympathize and deal gently with us. But he did not compromise and sin in order to get that way, to get that understanding. So the Levitical priesthood has limitations inherent in who they are because they sin, because they die, because they cannot continually live in that office. But also they have some limitations because of even the place that they serve. The temple itself, that the readers are so eager to, to get back into good graces with, they need to understand that even the temple that those priests are serving at is only a replica, a stand-in for the real thing. So in speaking about the priests and the Levites, it says they 
offer service in a replica, in a foreshadower of the heavenlies. One that is just as Moses was instructed by God when he was about to complete the tabernacle. For he says, see that you make everything according to the design that was shown to you on the mountain. There is a heavenly tabernacle, a heavenly temple, where other things are going on. Bigger things are going on. But this is not saying that the temple is not important. It's not saying that the temple is irrelevant, that it has no meaning or significance or, or has any part to play in the future. This is not saying that the temple won't have that role and that function for the believing community in the millennial kingdom. After all, it's designed exactly as Moses was instructed, as he was shown. And David followed that pattern. You know, the tabernacle and the temple on earth represent the one that exists in God's presence. It's this replica, it's this copy, it foreshadows the heavenly. It's a connection point with heaven and the kingdom. And I got thinking about it, it kind of reminded me of, you know, when, when Jacob was fleeing and going up to see Laban, he stopped at Bethel, and he, go, fall, he goes down, he falls asleep, puts his head on a rock, and he sees what? He sees the staircase, right, that goes up, or the, or the, uh, the ladder, as some of them are translated as. And it got to th me to thinking about this in the sense of the staircase or the ladder that is reaching up to heaven has to have a, a base and a top, right? There are angels that are ascending and descending on this thing that he was able to see. So it's like this is the, the bottom, the base of the of that staircase. It's like the connection point for the things that are going on up there. And uh, the angels are coming down and relaying their orders, relaying uh, all the things that need to be done, the messages that need to be given. And so what's happening here is supposed to be this foreshadow uh, and this, this information or this location that is important for the things that are going on at the heavenly tabernacle. And the fact that it's foreshadowing means that someday we're supposed to get a glimpse, not just of the one that's the replica, we're supposed to get a glimpse of the what? Of the real thing. The real thing is supposed to come down in the Messianic era in the new Jerusalem. And the one who inaugurates all of that, the one who is the, that starts all of that is the Messiah, our great high priest. And I'll get more into how he is contrasted in superior next week. Just remember, though, that Yeshua is proven to be superior without ripping apart, without tearing down, without minimizing or denigrating the importance and the validity of the temple, without uh, the importance of the priesthood, uh, even the high priest, even the guy who was persecuting them. But Yeshua is the one to whom we should hold on to above all else. He is the one who is the high priest that we need. He serves at the heavenly tabernacle, not made by man, and he is the mediator of a better covenant. We're going to get into that more next week and such. But he is the one who gives us strength and hope and endurance to carry on through the things that are happening here. And just because we may not see him now fulfilling all of those roles and, and, and in his power and in his glory doesn't mean that we should not hold on to our faith. Because we, what we don't see today, faith is the idea and the understanding that faith may soon one day become sight. We believe that someday he will. And so he goes, going back to Hebrews 4, Therefore, since we have a great Kohen Gadol who has passed through the heavens, 
Yeshua ben Elohim, let us hold firmly to our confessed allegiance. For we do not have a Kohen Gadol who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all the same ways, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near to the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may see, receive mercy and find grace for help in our time of need. That's who we are holding on to. And so when we understand who He is, and we understand what's really going on in this world. We need to fix our eyes on Him, the author and perfecter of our faith. We need to fix our eyes and keep our gaze focused on Him. And not on the troubles, not on the persecutions, not on the ones who even think that you're ignorant or think that you're deluded because the, some of the things that they were saying about the Messianic believers when this was written, guess what they're saying about you? How many of y'all have heard some of those things that people say? Yeah. Most things are still said. And we may get it from the Jewish side of things who don't accept Messiah. We may get it from the traditional Christian side of things who don't know or keep the Torah. Whose opinion matters? His does. Our great high priest's opinion matters. And again, though we may not see it in effect right now, doesn't mean that it won't be. And he will be glorified. He will show himself holy in the sight of all the people through our great high priest. And he will hold accountable all of those that claim to be speaking for him. 